Hey there, I'm David Shaw. I'm a lecturer up here at Kresge College, and we are at the Kresge Garden, nestled amongst the bay trees and the oak trees and the redwood trees at the top of the great Porter Meadow. Hi, I, I'm Mike Rotkin, and uh, I came to Santa Cruz in the summer of 1969 for a summer job and decided to stay after about two days. I began at uh, UCSC as a graduate student in the History of Consciousness graduate program the following fall, 1969. I've also been the mayor of Santa Cruz five times and elected six times to the Santa Cruz City Council. Uh, my name is Irene O'Connell and I'm a former student here. I studied art and Latin American studies. The UC Santa Cruz campus is 2,000 acres and most of it is in the north part of the campus, in upper campus. And uh, it's a wilderness area for the most part. There's a couple of trails and fire roads, logging roads that have been cut through the upper campus. But by and large, it's a wilderness area next to uh, Henry Cowell Redwood State Park, next to Wilder Ranch State Park, next to Pogonip City Park. So it's this, it's this you know, 1,000 plus acre upper campus next to 10,000 acres of wilderness area. So combined, it's a huge biological corridor. We have a gem up there. This campus might have been a state park. You know, um, the education in biology and the natural sciences um, are well suited to this place, the field studies, right? UCSC has long been known as a center for organic agriculture as well. Um, it's a good place to become nature connected. Mister, I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues. Upper campus is pretty much the reason why I chose UCSC to come to college. I mean, I was first brought to the campus when I was 10 years old, and I just knew that this forest and this land was a place where I wanted to spend my time, you know, growing and developing. So um, when I found that, out that it was being threatened by future development and concrete and buildings, I just thought that that's not really what we need right now. Uh, my name is Jeff Arnett. I transferred here in 1968, graduated in 72, came back in 79, graduated again in 81, and then um, after graduate school came here to teach in about 86, 1986. And, I've been teaching here ever since. I'm Brent Haddad and I've been a professor here at UC Santa Cruz for 17 years. My name is Jim Burns and my job title is Director of Public Affairs. Um, that's in the Division of University Relations and I've been at Santa Cruz uh, as a staff person for almost 30 years. Uh, my name is Noah Miska and I'm a student at UCSC, a senior this year, uh, which is kind of scary. And um, I've done a lot of organizing while I've, while I've been at UCSC, but my most recent project was Growth Magazine, which um, is, to my knowledge, the first uh, in-depth publication that's uh, been made by students exclusively about uh, the Long Range Development Plan. Well, the Long Range Development Plan, or LRDP, is a, uh, an important document because it basically was the attempt of the university to formally plan growth. Uh, I think if you go back 30 or 40 years ago, people just started putting up buildings in places, and more and more now we require growth plans, an idea of what the impacts are going to be, environmental studies of the impacts, and so forth. So the Long Range Development Plan was a document trying to spread, uh, set out how the university saw itself growing for the 20-year period. Um, that'll be now, it's uh, 18 years left of it, or 17 years left of it. And uh, I think an important document because it allowed people to understand what the university was thinking about and what the impacts would likely be. Long Ridge development plans are roughly akin to a city or county general plan. So, so what, they t what they try to do, you know, perfectly or imperfectly, is sort of come up with some best land use ideas for how, a, how a, a, in this case, a campus might grow, might look at build out, or how it might evolve to that point in time. Uh, it gives possible locations for new buildings, uh, new roads, new, new sewer systems. Uh, and just, just to give you a little bit of background, the, the 2005 LRDP, which is the current one, um, is, the, is the fifth long range development plan um, that the campus has had. 
it's created in response to a mandate that uh, the UC accommodate a, a certain percentage of graduating high school seniors every year. Speaking as a member of the campus community, um, I don't think generally campus growth is good for students or faculty or for the educational quality of what goes on here. I saw the LRDP and I thought, man, this is going to be gone. 100, 150 acres of logging, you know, major roads, um, buildings and so on. I speak for the trees. Let them grow. Let them grow. But nobody listens too much, don't you know? I speak for the trees, and I'll yell and I'll shout for the fine things on earth that are on their way out. I'm not sure the design makes sense given the ecosystem that's up there, but also given the needs of the future generations of humans and the non, uh, more than human world as well. Who knows what the future students or Santa Cruz community residents will be needing? Current students at the university don't necessarily benefit from growth. I think the faculty don't really benefit from growth, at least in terms of the, their role as teachers. Uh, it's probably the case that the campus as a whole benefits uh, from the uh, economic advantage they have by being willing to grow in the UC system. What are we actually growing out? And I think the students uh, of the future will be the primary losers of this plan. I think that if we were to grow the campus out and have more students, we'd lose quality and gain quantity. Well, I think if we uh, do a good job of it, it's just fine. It's been going. Uh, campus growth has been uh, really, really large throughout my entire career here. About every year for my first decade, at UC Santa Cruz, we grew by about 400 students. And it was remarkable for me to see one building after another spring up. The, uh, the large parking structure uh, was built on very pretty open space. At the same time, I appreciated that the uh, population of the state was growing. You know, here the university tell it, all they're trying to do is respond to the of the growing number of uh, high school graduates in California that must be accommodated according to them. The UC has to accept the top eighth, uh, that's 12.5% of graduating high school seniors in California. And um, the, that, that population is growing every year and more and more of those students are applying to UC. So there is some pressure to, um, to expand campus in response to potential enrollment increases. I think the major pressure for growth is not so we can be a better research institution or a better place for our students to get an education or, or because we could provide better public service to the community, but it's really because the office of the president will take the campus more seriously as a place deserving resources if they're willing to grow and accept more students. I haven't really heard the community members calling for a growth of campus. The students here haven't been calling for a growth in campus. I haven't heard any students say that they want a new physical education facility or more research facilities or a new entrance to campus. One, one component of the Long Range Development Plan is, is a new classroom unit that would have, um, I think it's a 600-seat a lecture hall, a 400-seat lecture hall, and a 200-seat lecture hall. And, and when you're making buildings like that, you're architecturally cementing the educational experience into, into a certain form. And frankly, there's a really significant difference in educational quality when you move from serious seminar discussions where people are reading and engaging the world and bringing their ideas to discussion versus sort of sitting relatively passively in a lecture hall with another 529 students uh, receiving knowledge uh, from uh, no matter how, how important the knowledge is or how smart the teacher where they're basically a passive recipient of knowledge rather than uh, involved in the, the creation of it. And you know you, you talk to the students and you realize the congestion in terms of getting into classes um, Get, you know, getting GEs that they need to take, um, even classes for their major. So um, I think that affects the quality of education. Um, and I think the larger it's gotten, the less personal it's become. Increasing enrollment so drastically and by um, expanding into the forest to accommodate that enrollment increase, the university is destroying a lot of the, the things that 
that make the student experience here so special and so vibrant. I take issue with the long-range development planning process, mainly. Uh, one mentor told me once, you're either at the table or on the menu. And I believe that a lot of students nowadays and just community stakeholders are really on the menu and aren't together at the table with the planners. Gets at the spirit of what we should really be trying to do, which is provide students with you, tomorrow's students like you, with the same opportunities that you enjoyed, but try to figure out within reason, not, not a perfect world, how to do that with the, the least impact possible. There's some like non-transparency when we're talking about more opportunities for higher education, especially when there's being classes cut, teacher positions cut, um, departments like ethnic studies not being offered, communi community studies being cut. I think there's an institutional arrogance that, you know, we know better, trust us. That's, uh, that's dangerous. You come up with issues like, like habitat fragmentation. For instance, if you're putting in a new road, um, you are going to divide two sections of habitat that were previously connected. And I think even in the developed areas of the campus, I think you would, most people would, could admit, some perhaps reluctantly, that we've done a pretty good job of stewarding trees. Look, Lorax, calm down. There's no cause for alarm. I chopped down just one tree. I'm doing no harm. I would be hesitant uh, to believe that, that any construction in upper campus would be eco-friendly. Uh, because even if the uh, buildings are uh, you know, energy efficient, water efficient, um, you're still going to be building in, in a redwood forest. I think it's going to be you know, isolated stands of redwood surrounded by roads, building, uh, buildings and people. What it's supposed to do is outline all of the potential uh, negative impacts on wildlife and, and natural systems uh, in, in the areas that would be developed. The, the EIR has been uh, critiqued pretty heavily by uh, biologists and ecologists and uh, natural scientists, many of them affiliated with UCSC, a lot of them UCSC professors. Um, and it, it contains, um, according to the, these scientists, a lot of holes that have yet to be addressed. There are, there are quite a few impacts that, that could result from campus expansion that are not detailed uh, in the environmental impact report. Uh, the EIR that I read I thought was poorly um, poorly written um, and they you know they've lost in court several times because what they're doing I think um, at the core of it is is wrong but they're also I think sometimes trying to skirt the law my name is Rick Longinati and I co-founded Santa Cruz desal alternatives which was meant to advocate for alternatives to to the you know highly energy intensive desalination project. I'm Helen Mayor Harrison. Um, and I'm Newton Harrison. We're an artist team. Right now, uh, we, we, we used to teach at University of California at San Diego, and we're part of its formation, actually, yeah. way back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, my name's Gary Patton. I uh, moved with my family to Santa Cruz in 1961, but then I went off to school. Now I'm an environmental attorney practicing law in Santa Cruz, sort of right back downtown where I started off as a young attorney. So desalination is the process of turning ocean water into fresh water. And it does so by using large amounts of electricity to uh, accomplish a process called reverse osmosis. So the energy intensity of this desalination project will be 10 times the energy intensity of our current water source for the city of Santa Cruz. The desal plant does play into the issue of upper campus expansion. Uh, when the university was drafting up its long-range development plan, the local community in the form of the county and the city, the governments, county and city government, and local community groups all uh, indicated that uh, they thought that this growth plan of the university was not good, that it was actually going to have a lot of adverse impacts. So there was a lawsuit. And in connection with the lawsuit, there ultimately was a settlement, 
and in connection with the settlement, the city of Santa Cruz has promised the university that it will build incremental modules of desalination plants as necessary, and the, here's the phrase, to meet system demand. The university <clears throat> needs water to expand. Uh, the university's request to uh, have additional water from the city of Santa Cruz practically doubles the water use that they've been using for the last couple of years. They're asking for water at a time, at a very inopportune time for the city of Santa Cruz. Water supplies are stretched. There is a challenge during a drought year, and particularly a second year of a drought year. Uh, there's a challenge from fish habitat of leaving enough water in the streams to allow the fish to reproduce. And meanwhile, the university wants more water. This means that <clears throat> uh, the desalination really enables the university expansion. Without desalination, it's really questionable whether our political leaders would allocate more water to the university. But without that additional water, the kind of growth that the university has projected probably will not be possible. When you hit on a bad policy, there's a lot of bad things to it. You know, in the case of desalination, it's got a bad impact on the environment through energy. That The energy comes from fossil fuel sources of which we have a short supply and the supplies that we do get are getting more and more environmentally damaging in order to extract them. But the good solutions, the good policy solutions have multiple benefits as well. When you have collaboration between districts, you're talking about people getting along with each other and being able to share water. When you're talking about uh, uh, really coming to grips with the limits of growth, you're talking about a conversation that could take place at the university or here in town as well as what is the optimum size for our community? At what point do we say, you know what, maybe we've reached the carrying capacity of this particular piece of land to accommodate people, and it's time to call, call it quits on growth. Now, thanks to your hacking my trees to the ground, there's not enough truffula fruit to go around. I personally believe this is a kind of crossroads for the community. Uh, Santa Cruz County, over the years, and I've been involved with public policy issues for a long, long time, over the years, the community of Santa Cruz has tried to live in balance with the natural environment. And growth is constrained by that. Uh, growth is constrained by our decisions to protect certain environmental attributes, like the lands of the North Coast, like agricultural lands. We've made public decisions, uh, commitments as a community, to limit our growth and development. Desal busts the borders of that. It basically says we are not going to be constrained by water. And I think that's a huge philosophical issue. We're um, forgetting our ability to collect natural water. That What that tells us is that there's a small lobby group who sees a lot of profit in making this. And they're doing so, um, in my opinion, against the public interest. In the city of Santa Cruz, the issue is if you have an extended drought, uh, what kind of an impact will that have on this uh, community? And the way things are going now without an additional water supply, that would be a very serious impact. Um, it would uh, affect the economy, it would cost people jobs, and it would also risk uh, public health. And so uh, this purpose of the desal plant is to provide water in the summer um, during extended droughts. Um, you know, traffic is bad enough as it is and it's going to get worse. And, and no matter you know, how they make promises about mitigating it, it's mostly wishful thinking. But the permanent damage will be to these, um, these trees and all the flora and fauna that exist because they're here. So once we go down that road, it's, it's too late. The university in the past had never really taken seriously the impacts they were having on the housing market in Santa Cruz, driving low-income people out of town, on the traffic and transportation system, creating congestion and air pollution, those kinds of issues, as well as impacting the city budget in terms of students using city parks, increased need for police and fire protection. Traffic congestion, sewer, water, and uh, destruction of habitat up here on the upper campus. When, when you hear the term privatization of the UC, people are generally referring to the fact that uh, UC used to be free. 
people should understand that at one point the University of California was 100% supported by tax dollars, the people of the state of California. We're now down to about 16 or 17% of the UC budget being covered by tax dollars and the rest is now coming from private sources. Some of them are government uh, grants and funding, but a lot of the, the uh, support is from private donations. And I think the effect of that is that you have a university that much more responds to the needs of the private sector, to the large multinational corporations that rule in the realm of the private sector, and much less to the public needs and to try and prepare students to go out in the world and actually be advocates for what's good for the general community and society as a whole. Rather, the question is going to be what's good for a corporation. I feel like there's more lecturers and grad students teaching than tenure track faculty. There's more undergraduate TAs than paid TAs. It seems like there's penny pinching going on on all levels and maybe maybe there's a, an economic reason and incentive behind growth and development more than a justice or educational or ecological um, reason for growing out campus. When you start putting a price tag on education some people are automatically going to be left out. There are people who won't even consider applying to the UC because of how expensive it is. We're in pretty dire times right now. Um, the costs are being more and more put onto students' intuition and less and less coming from the state. I think people have to understand fundamentally that UC is a corporation. Uh, it's, it was a public corporation. It's still named as a public corporation. But it's run by a board of regents. And the board of regents are made up of people who, the majority of whom are I have the following qualification. They gave some governor a great deal of money, at least a million, sometimes two million dollars for a campaign to get elected the governor of California. And they don't have to have any evidence that they know anything about education or higher education or any of the kinds of public goals of an educational system. They basically have to be people that want to be a region and give a, a governor a big donation for a campaign. The end result is the regents are made up of the corporate leaders of America and the kind of values that they carry out when they think about their private real estate interests and their corporate interests in running large corporations uh, are basically the values they bring to the UC system. We're gonna get rich, build the rich. No more holes in a stocking, turn the tech we hawk into the house of the glorious ones we go. Gentlemen, I wish to speak for the trees. Here are some facts to cogitate and ruminate. It takes 10 months for a truffula seed to germinate. It takes 10 long years before the seed grows into a sapling. It takes 10 more years. <laughs> the construction projects are partially paid for by our tuition. Um, and they're partially paid for by our tuition because the regents are not uh, legally allowed to use um, certain certain federal funds, certain state funds for construction. Um, and by switching towards, towards private tuition, they have a lot more leeway with how they can use that money and they can put it towards building new buildings. And I think that's really sad. I think that higher education is not living up to its promise that it once did. Um, it was really framed as as a project in service of humanity, right? Go to the university and study the totality of the universe and discover new knowledge and, and, and be a repository for knowledge and feed that back out into the world. It's not really serving that need right now. And so it's being really, you know, it's under construction. It's being rethought. So I think the growth here is driven not by educational goals or by uh, research goals or knowledge goals. It's really driven by a kind of financial plan of the university and the idea that this has to be a place that will grow if it's going to get resources. I don't think the LRDP is really being made in the name of education. It seems like more of an economic move. Students can just be part of the conversation, start talking about it, and eventually start saying no. I mean, we're paying all these tuition dollars and who's making the decisions? I think we have like one student representative for all of the UCs on the board, on the Regents board. Um, but I, so I think we need to make more demands on student representation in um, decision-making bodies. They don't necessarily have to be placed in uh, such, such a sensitive ecosystem as, as a redwood forest. In an ideal world, or at least your ideal world, we would just cap the place and make it so that it didn't grow at all, despite the fact that 
that there was increased demand for higher education. So um, I think the need is something that uh, needs to be you know, really looked at in the light of the big picture um, because I just think it's a really terrible idea. And not just because they'll destroy habitat, but there are better places to put more people and this is not one of them. So I think building into the forest might be the easier way out, but it's, it's not the only way out. And there, you know, this, this fall, for instance, or for this coming fall, we received a record number of applications to UC Santa Cruz. What are we going to do about it? What are we going to do with that? Just basically close the door because we've hit some arbitrary number? Uh, I, I think what makes more sense to us is to try to accommodate students as best as the budget permits. But they say that's, that's the impetus. You know, they don't want to develop this land, but they have to. I don't buy that. I don't think you have to do anything if it's a bad idea. And it's a bad idea. And a lot of people have pointed that out. Really preserving this incredible and unique place that we have a campus. These 2,000 acres are incredibly special. And I think on some level, that never really was adequately addressed in the final LRDP. On a, on a campus of higher education, people often have different views and, they, and, and boy, and if you can't express different views here, hopefully doing it civilly, as you and I are doing right now, um, then where else are you gonna do that? I mean, this is, this is college. You care more about the place. You know, you get the sense of place, the students that really get up here, walk around, ride their bikes, run. And I don't think the university really gets that. You know, to them, I think it's still, well, yeah, there are a lot of nice trees, but it's undeveloped land. And I think that's, uh, you know, it's been the nature of any entity that wants to grow, develop, build. I just don't think they see that. It's hard to quantify the experience of being up here. I mean, one reason, you know, I try to get students up here during my classes is to appreciate what we've got, especially because it might be gone. It's so daunting sometimes to be up against these these governing bodies who make their decisions from air-conditioned offices somewhere far away. You know, we don't have that face-to-face -face contact. And, you know, some people have been talking about, well, it would be great to bring, like, regents or the chancellor up here. See what you're actually affecting with your decisions. With this kind of uh, problem, knowledge is power. And there is a long history of resistance to uh, UCSC expansion projects. You know, what I'd urge people to do that are interested in this remarkable uh, place up here is uh, educate themselves, you know, find out, really look at the plans. I think that one thing that's really important to do is to actually get out into the forest. And I, I say that because it's, in my opinion, the best way to remind yourself why it's worth preserving. Um, it's a really special place and there's nothing that, that I can say that would really convey the extent to which that's true.